Hello, and welcome to High Throughput Assays for Cardiac Toxicity and Discovery on the Slip Protector System. My name is Kevin, and I'll be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx session today, please dial 1-866-229-3239. And for operator assistance, please dial star zero. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. However, you may ask an online question at any time today throughout the presentation by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar in the top of your screen. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your first presenter for today, Deborah Gallant. Deborah, you now have the floor. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so welcome everyone to Molecular Devices webinar on high throughput assays for cardiac toxicity and discovery on the flipper tetra system. This is a continuation of our series Innovative Assays for the Flipper Tetra System, GPCRs, ion channels, stem cells, and more. Uh, my name is Deborah and I'm the product manager for the Flipper and Cell Key System product families and I'm going to be your host today. So cardiomyocytes derived from stem cell sources uh, have been shown to greatly or can greatly accelerate the discovery of cardiac drugs and improve drug safety by offering more clinically relevant cell-based models than those presently available. Today's speaker will present an overview of the availability and benefits of human cardiomyocytes for drug discovery and toxicity testing, and will demonstrate how one can use the flipper tetra system to measure the impact of pharmacological compounds on cardiomyocytes. She will present the newly released framework to Peep Pro software, which enables scientists to automatically count number and frequency of cardiomyocyte contractions, as well as measure key temporal parameters important for cardiotoxicity assessment. You'll learn how to use the Flipper Capture System and the Flipper Calcium 5 assay kit paired with our Peep Pro software module to deliver high precision, sensitivity, and throughput to this critical assay for cardiac safety and discovery. So we're pleased to have Carol Crittenden, Drug Discovery Application Scientist for Molecular Devices, join us today to give this presentation. A little bit about Carol. She's a graduate of Oral Roberts University. Uh, she began and spent the first 13 years of her career working at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, first working in the histocompatibility lab, and later performing research on the effects of growth factors on hematopoietic progenitor development. Later, she worked at uh, a couple of biotechnology companies, including Cell Therapeutics and Molecumetics. With a tenure there spanning over 10 years, Carol held many positions, including drug discovery researcher and core tissue culture lab manager. During this time, she developed assays to screen for anti-cancer compounds and later for compounds that affect GPCRs using a Flipper 384 instrument, a predecessor to today's Flipper Tetra system. In 2002, Carol moved from being a Flipper customer to Molecular Devices as a marketing application scientist for the Flipper product line. And today, she continues to support GPCR and ion cell applications development in addition to developing new areas of application for the Flipper Tetra system and other molecular devices products. The title of Carol's talk today, as already mentioned, is High Throughput Assays for Cardiotoxicity and Discovery on the Flipper Tetra System. And as mentioned, following the presentation, we will conclude today's webinar with a question and answer session. Um, and just as Kevin already indicated, uh, if you want to begin to ask questions during the talk, although we won't answer them until the conclusion of the talk, uh, you can go and press the question toolbar or the question button on the toolbar to expand the Q&A window, and you can type your questions in at the bottom of uh, that Q&A window. Okay. So with that in mind, um, let me turn this over to Carol, and she can begin today's presentation. Good morning. This is Carol Crittenden, and I'm happy to be able to talk to you today. And we're going to talk about safety in a different paradigm. We're going to talk about the fact that it's really important. I can show you a whole bunch of slides about Biox and all the compounds that have been pulled off the market for um, interfering with long QT syndrome and, and many others, but I think you're probably all familiar with that. So I think we're just going to jump right into the, talking about the challenge. 
And one of the things that I think has been discovered and has been mentioned by the FDA and is becoming um, more and more of the standard in drug discovery industry from both um, a safety perspective as well as, as the earlier stages of drug discovery is the importance of incorporating human biology earlier in the drug development pipeline to be able to fail those cardiotoxic compounds early rather than waiting until expensive drug discovery efforts have been taken or into preclinical or even into the clinical system itself. And the other important thing is becoming um, evidence that cardiac drug discovery needs to have an element where it's carried out in an integrated system. And so today we're going to talk about being able to do that and taking a look at, at um, the flipper tetra system as an element in that environment. So this is kind of a newer application, but I think it's really important to realize that as cardiomyocytes can beat, they do give off calcium sparks or transient calcium signals, and you can actually um, capture that signal on the flipper tetra system. So we're going to talk about how we do that today. So you can see in the slide on the left, we've got um, calcium 5 images from our um, molecular devices, Image Express IX microsystem. And then on the right, we've got some um, calcium signaling as we've captured it on the flipper tetra. So traditionally, cardiomyocyte cell beating um, early on has been, has been studied in individual channels um, along the um, graph called the action potential. And one of these, of course, is HERG, um, which leads to an elongation of uh, the recovery time of a heartbeat. And cardiomyocyte sparking, which is what we're taking a look at, is um, an approximate model for some of that. And so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about how we do that and, and what things we're seeing as predictors to um, some of these elements along the way in an integrated system. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about IPS cardiomyocytes. Um, because they are a large um, capacity for uh, and renewable capacity for cells for um, high throughput or for, for larger volume screening. We're going to talk about a little overview of the Flipper Tetra system with the ScreenWorks Peak Pro software, um, just because we might have some folks that aren't dedicated Flipper users at this, at, at this talk. And then we're going to talk about capturing those calcium sparks or transient calcium signaling with the Flipper Tetra Calcium 5 kit. And then we're going to put it all together and take a look at the effects of um, some of these cardiotoxic and cardioactive compounds and what that looks like and the analysis we can perform with the parameters from the ScreenWorks Peak Pro software. So stem cell-derived um, cardiomyocytes are really an attractive alternative to primary cells because they're a lot easier to get. They can be um, generated in large quantities. They're homogeneous. Um, the cardiotoxic um, the protection assays um, are in high demand for um, screening of drug candidates. And it's important um, for that cardiomyocytes can be commercially available or they can be generated within a company uh, of interest. Today's cardiomyocytes that we're using and showing in these assays have been generously donated to us by Cellular Dynamics International, and we um, give special thanks to Blake Hansen and his crew for that. So um, IPS cells um, are expanded for three to seven days and um, turned into cardiomyocytes, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's done with the, with the uh, differentiation process. But they've been well studied, and um, they're um, cardiotoxicity can be shown, as well as the electrophysiology profiles um, and other things have been developed as well. So the cell model for the predict predictive toxicity, again, is the, in our case, we're going to talk about the I-cell cardiomyocytes from cellular dynamics. The first thing they've done is from an individual sample, and these don't need to be taken from embryonic cell, stem cells at all. They can be taken from a skin sample or a fibroblast. Um, which is, again, another advantage. Um, a master cell bank is created, and um, the appropriate genetic engineering is, is carried out to 
uh, basically reprogram the cell backwards and then take it forwards um, as, a, as a stem cell cardiomyocyte. And then they can be expanded and then stored frozen, um, so you will have the indefinite ability to expand these differentiated cells. Um, if further differentiation is needed, they can be differentiated into heart, neuron, liver, blood cells, um, blood vessel cells. We are particularly interested today in the cardiomyocytes. Um, and then they go through a purification and a storage process. So when they arrived to us frozen, um, we saw them out and placed it in a, in, um, a gel-coated plate. We'll talk about that a little bit. And um, incubate them for three to five days, and they begin to beat as a complete cell one, and they're ready to go. So a cardiomyocyte sparking has been studied in muscle tissue and other um, tissues, um, even in, as far back as the 80s and the 90s. And what you're looking at now is an MAP Express micro um, images from uh, with the flipper calcium 5 kit, and just to um, take a real quick um, look at that sparking process. So we, we started, that's kind of where our in-house studies began, is we started with that sparking. And we found that really interesting. And then we noticed that we did some we cal um, calcium AM and some other dyes, and we thought, let's try out calcium 5. And so since we could see it so clearly, we decided that we should move it over to the flipper. And so what you're taking a look at here on the top, again, is that calcium-5 sparking um, shown on the IX microsystem, um, but the corresponding correlated graph from the flipper, flipper calcium-5 signal intensity is shown below. And if you notice here, I've got epinephrine added to the cells, and they greatly speed up the beat rate of this cell line. And then Veraptamil slows it down, so you're going to see, we're going to wait here for a second, and then we're going to see one, there goes one very wimpy little bead. But you can see that we easily have been able to differentiate the patterns. And so in that process, then, um, we can characterize those calcium sparks or um, transient calcium signals and actually count the beads per minute and um, generate EC50 and IC50 curves. So the flipper tetra system, just a real quick overview, provides a, an assay simplicity. So it brings kind of the high throughput mentality to something as complicated as these feeding cardiomyocytes because it's really quite a simple thing to set up. Um, the, the mechanics are provided um, depending on the need of the customer, um, whether it's a low, all the way up to 1536 wells. We can read all these wells at the same time so that the, um, rather than trying to read them one well at a time, you get the same signals. And with the advantage and addition of the ScreenWorks Peak Pro software, we can now deliver on the fly analysis of some of these important peak characteristics. And what this does in a different groups, perhaps, um, than have been thought of with GPCRs in the past, is bring that ability to pre-screen and remove cardiotoxic compounds from the generation, and then also quickly direct SAR and med chem efforts on a larger scale um, earlier in the process, as well then, of course, as taking a look at, it, at safety. So I'm going to talk to you real quick about the Flipper Calcium Dye Assay Kit. It has um, two, basically two elements. One is a calcium-sensitive ionophore that goes um, inside the cell, so it's again measuring intracellular calcium, and that red area around the diagram represents the quench technology that's around the outside, which reduces the cell background. And this is important because the um, background having um, removed from the situation helps with the smaller calcium spark signal. So, um, whereas we would have a very large signal during a GPCR event with calcium release, in this case, uh, we might have 200 to 500 counts. So it's a homogeneous assay, and I think this is really important in conjunction with the cardiomyocytes because if they formed a cell beating lawn on top of um, a 
gel in the, in the well, we don't want to disturb that by doing a lot of washing. So just being able to add the dye and incubate helps to preserve that important beading line. And then, very simply, when the calcium is released during cal the calcium sparking or transient calcium signal, um, it comes into contact and it fluoresces. So this is just a real quick look at the workflow. Um, the cells are thawed and, and plated in special media into the gelatin coated plates. And then after three to five days, they'll gap junctions begin to form and all of the cells that are necessary um, in their organization to form a beating wand within the well. Um, and then they're ready for the assay. So we just load with the calcium five dye for, for an hour. And then you're ready to run the assay. Um, by adding compounds and reading that calcium signal. And the last step is analyzing the data using Screenworks Peak Pro software. So um, we've got flipper parameters. They're easy to set up, easy to adjust. And then this is what a full signal would look like. In this case, we've added isoproteranol, so we've actually sped up the beat. Um, but this is what the signal looks like from just one well. Um, we'll show you what's all. 384 wells, take what that looks like here in a minute. In fact, here it is. I'm going to take a drink of water here real quick. So this is what the high throughput um, 384 well view looks like for an entire plate of cardiac um, beating cells. And we've treated them with various and sundry compounds that both um, speed up the beating or slow it down or interfere with it. But this is just to kind of give you an overview of the fact that every single one of these wells was read at the same time, and you can generate all this data in less than two minutes. Um, the other thing you can notice is that there's a number on each well, and I'll show you how to do this in a little bit, but that is actually the um, beat count per well. So for looking at it from an overview standpoint, um, it's nice for a quick on-the-fly analysis to take a look at this. So the Pick Pro software takes a look at a number of reductions, including, um, and so on the right they're listed. We've also included standard deviations for those because these are all averages. But the big ones are peak frequency and peak count, um, peak width. And then the amplitude at um, temp or the average peak width at 10% amplitude, and we'll show you why this one is really important. Rise times, decay times. So some of the things that folks are looking at um, as they're studying the calcium spark, it can be some pretty interesting predictors. Um, we also have um, the ability to identify irregular spacing um, and to identify the fact that peaks might be missing or that we have extra peaks or arrhythmias. So this is um, just a full screen from Peak Pro or from Screenworks, um, and then the Peak Pro edition will, will show how that works. I'm going to run a little movie and kind of talk as we go through it. Um, and what we've got is a picture of after we've been, we've done the analysis, and we can click on individual wells, and they will show up on the left. There's a peak count or software which brings up the, the reduction screen and you can choose which of these parameters you want to take a look at. In this case, we're looking at peak count. We can also configure the peak detection, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail later. But if you need to do curve smoothing, you can do that as well. That was the button that you turn on to take a look at the numbers from the individual parameters that you're looking at at the time. You can see that. Um, Higher numbers, obviously. You can see the profile on the left as well as the number. And one of the things that, that we can show dramatically here is we've used a compound called cisapride. It's a herd blocker, and it is associated with a with an elongated QT syndrome. And you can see when we go to the um, peak height at 10% amplitude that we can measure um, very dramatically the difference here, so we're going to expand that screen a little bit so you can take a look at that recovery, at that, um, recovery time. You'll notice that it's almost 12 seconds here in this case, whereas if you look at something that's not affected by that in another well, um, you can see that it's about, I think when we expand it up here, it's going to be three to four seconds. A little over four seconds. 
So I think that's real, it's a very important and useful trend, and it takes a look at things on the fly, as well as if you've got some situation where you've got a compound that actually gives you double peaks, you can take a look at that as well. And that will also show up with the um, irregular peak software identification, which we don't have that part turned on right now because we're looking at this, um, the peak width at 10% um, amplitude. It's also quite easy to export the compounds or export the compounds, export the data, and you can export multiple ones. So you're just clicking on the export button, you're and clicking on enable, and then there's already three there, but you can add, easily add a file and then specify which of the ones that you want to be able to export. And you can also put them all in the same file, so that makes it easy for data handling. To your, um, to your to export your limb system as well. So just to kind of go back, if you went through this real quickly in, in the little movie, but um, you can configure the peak detection and parameters um, for optimization. Um, it provides the opportunity to, to do just a little bit of um, smoothing peak width or fitting. You can change the slope threshold a little bit. So far, in what we've seen, even with things like the surprise and these other um, compounds that are not standard, um, we haven't had to use this very much yet. So um, it's there and it's available, um, but that's kind of kind of where things are with that. So we've kind of gone through all of this, and you know, you might wonder how are these cells, um, the, the cardiomyocytes, behaving in the wells? And there's um, very good assay reproducibility. So even though you, in this case we have a 384 well assay, we've got um, good good correlation amongst the controls. So you can see our well-to-well -well CVs are less than 10% in this particular assay, um, which is a very good standard um, when working with a cell-based assay system. And within the software, and this would show up on the screen as well, um, there's a, click, a little button you can click on from those parameters, which will identify beating irregularities. So you can see you can find out if it's okay. If you've got irregular beating, as you can you can see with lidocaine, isoproteranol, right after um, the compound is added, um, beating stops for a little bit. So it will identify that. Or as in the case of the stenozole, when you've got extra peaks, that will be identified as well. So um, we did the export from the other side during the movie, but this is basically one, one of the views of exported data. It can be um, opened directly by Excel. You can also take it straight and put it into your limb system. Um, in this case, it's in 384 well format. You can also add another layer of um, identifying concentrations and um, reporting um, averages and standard deviations at those concentrations. And that's easy also to grab, um, grab and graph if you want to as well. So I'm going to take another little drink of water here. Excuse me. So one of the things we can do with all of that data and those parameters is really get a good comparison going um, from three different compounds. We just chose isoproteranol, like control, and propranolol. But you can see with isoproteranol, um, the peak, the number of peaks and the beat frequency is much higher because it's beating, you know, faster than the control. And then for parallel, where it slowed down, you can see you've got 7.2 beats per minute versus 12 from the control. And then in this case, we've also looked at rise time and decay time for each one of those, uh, the average rise time and decay time during during these reads. And you can see with isoproteranol, as it speeds up, the rise time and decay times um, actually significantly decrease. Whereas for parallel, you can see the rise time increases, but the decay time significantly um, increases. So now we're going to um, shift gears for a little bit and talk about proof of concept um, for some, some known compound effects. So this is another plate of cells um, that we that we ran, and then we used kind of a, a mishmash of, of um, compounds just to kind of see what kind of effect we were going to get, where we used um, isoproteranol, and we used, um, which is a beta adrenergic agonist, which obviously shows the DPCR-related effects, as well.
well as with um, epinephrine, and then um, some channel blockers, uh, cisapride, as well as um, an L type calcium channel blocker with nifedipine, and then a sodium channel blocker with tetrodotoxin and some others as well. So you can see we've, we've kind of shown epinephrine because it's the, that's the dramatic increase, but I can actually create that EC50 curve from within the um, Springwork software easily um, on, on the fly if I want to. So you can take, you know, it's easy to do an analysis. And again, you know, we've, we've talked about um, cisapride and how we've used the date count here to generate an IC50 curve um, from the beat count. And I've also taken a look at it um, from the peak width at the 10% height. So trototoxin is a sodium channel blocker, um, so it kind of gives a, an interesting pattern. Um, at the addition stage, well, because flipper tetra can um, start the reading um, simultaneous with compound addition, you can see that um, for a brief period of time, it actually stops the beating of the cardiomyocyte lawn in the well, and then when it picks up, not only is it fuller, but it's much more irregular. And you can see a real quick little graph about a decrease at 10 minutes. So we came back and read the plate again um, for a minute or so um, at the 10 minute time interval, and you can see the results there as well. So you can do this for, you know, any number of ion channel blockers, um, and we've talked about the surprise, the cytopene, toxin, as well as some of the, the various country hurt channel blockers. And so um, you can see definitely a dose-dependent um, inhibition in, in these areas, along with some IC50s. Another thing that um, one of our researchers um, here that works with me at uh, Molecular Devices, um, Dr. Oksana, um, sorry, oh my goodness, my brain, um, forgive me, um, did some work with positive and negative chronotropes. And it's quite, quite interesting. So the chronotropes, obviously, the positive ones sped the heart rate up, and then the negative ones slowed it down to the beat rates of the cells. And so we, we did this in 96 well just because we were, you know, comparing, comparing formats and, and protocols and everything. And we, again, got a really nice um, parameters in this as well. And so one of the experiments that she did were um, we used, kind of created a perspective model for testing drugs that affect the heart. So we took some cells, um, the same one, and set them up, and we added epinephrine first to speed up the beat rate, and then we followed it with a, an addition of either, in this case, a beta blocker, uh, propranolol, or verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker. And we were able to show that we were able to slow down the beats again, and um, we compared that with if we had just taken a normal beat rate and um, slowed it down. So there's kind of some interesting um, ways to measure the effect on beating. And um, again, we also took a look um, at some more HERG inhibitors. Um, this, we've talked about cisapride, you can see that it's very dramatic, but also estemazole. Um, with an increase in concentration gives you um, an elongation of that uh, recovery time as well. And then the, one of the um, last things that we did was we took a comparison of, based on our beat rate of the IC50s of another um, herd blocker, trifenidine, which was originally an allergy, uh, allergy drug, which was pulled off the market, as well as cisapride, which um, was originally supposed to be a, uh, an antacid, and compared those um, with the automated patch clamp for a herb cell line. Um, in our in this case, it was um, the Ironworks directly the automated patch clamp, and we got some pretty good correlation with the um, IC50 values. And then again, this is taking a look at surrogate markers for toxicity. Um, where on the bottom left, you can see we've, we've used a number of compounds, um, epinephrine, cisapride, 
lidocaine and propranolol, and again, the price stands out because now we're using the set of beat rates. We're actually using that peak width at 10% uh, height of the peak, and you'll notice that the surprise again stands out dramatically. As well, it's a little bit with propranolol and also a little bit with lidocaine. So being able to measure peak width and spacing um, may also help predict compounds that um, affect the, you know, that may induce long QT syndrome or rhythmias or other potentially um, dangerous events and not specific uh, events with these compounds. So in summary, and we want to thank you for, for listening to our, our talk today, um, cardiomyocytes and full protection system enable bio-relevant assays much earlier in the drug discovery process, and I think this is really important from a safety aspect as well as the target discovery aspect. The addition of Peak Pro software to ScreenWorks makes it possible to expand the peak detection for beating cardiomyocytes with those calcium sparks and other primary cells as well, um, enables analysis of the samples with multiple peaks per response, as well as being able to look at the different parameters. Um, there's no need for um, exporting this kinetic data in other software now for analysis. A big super user um, with algorithms in their head isn't necessarily um, required. And it's built on a pr proven screenwork software platform. And with the whole idea of the Flipper Tetra system, it's scalable. So if you're just getting started, 96 well works just fine. Um, if you wanted to use a few cells, fewer cells and do more compounds, 384 format uh, might be a choice for you. And it dramatically increases that safety throughput. I think this is really important. So I would like to um, acknowledge the contributors. Um, most importantly, Oksana Sharenko. Um, she worked in the lab tirelessly and has done uh, a great amount of work in this effort, as well as Evan Cromwell. James Hesley um, did much of the uh, work with the IX Micro, Ian Chen, um, Deborah Gallant, and Carlos Flores, who um, actually did a lot of the algorithms for the software. And again, a big thanks to Cellular Dynamics, Blake Anson and his crew, for um, the use of their um, party myocytes. Well, if you'll excuse me for just a second here, I'm going to turn this um, over to Deborah so that we can start um, the question and answer session. Thanks, Carol. Um, you can hear me. You can hear me now. I'm not on mute, correct? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so, as Carol mentioned, we're going to uh, begin the question and answer session, and as a reminder. Um, if you go uh, and pull down the question uh, mark in, in case the question Q&A uh, box isn't already open, you can choose the question um, question button and a Q&A box will pop up and then you can specifically answer, uh, add your questions into that uh, message box and send them to us and we'll put them in the queue to be answered. Um, we won't have time to go through everyone's questions today, most likely. Um, we'll probably take about five minutes or so of questions. And then we, uh, if we don't have time to answer all of them, we will try to respond to them afterwards uh, via email. Okay. Um, so one of the first questions, Carol, that came in was um, that the initial control beats per minute seems slow. And this is a two-part question. Um, the first qu part of that question was, is that inher inherent to the um, the cardiomyocyte type that we were using, or do we see that with other cardiomyocytes also? Um, and then the question is, uh, does one calcium spark equal one visible beat? So um, taking a look at that, the answering the first part of the question, um, we noticed that there's a little bit of lots of lot variability amongst the starting beat rates, um, and it depends on somewhat on cell health and which day we choose. Also, we've noticed um, the difference between, we've also done a little bit of work with the core AT um, mouse ES stem cells, um, cardiomyocytes, and they beat um, quite a bit faster. And so we've seen some variability. 
And um, so as there's um, a con an, ex or an excitation and a contraction of the cell lawn, you see if there's a, the calcium concentration changes, and so one peak does equal then um, one excitation and con um, contraction. Okay. Um, so I, I, another question that came in um, related to your your comments about being able to look at other cardiomyocytes um, was that the cells tend to be very expensive. Um, you know, are there numerous sources to get cardiomyocytes from, or in how, how many have we looked at? Um, I think I know we've looked at two, um, the two that I've mentioned. I believe we've looked at a third source, and I know that there are other commercial ones available, and I, off the top of my head, I can't list them, but I know there are other ones available commercially, and then I also know that there are large pharmas working on their own efforts um, to produce them in-house. Okay. Another question that came in is related to uh, HERG, and the question was, is it possible to look at the HERG effect specifically? So I think what we're looking at um, particularly in the case of, and I'll just use Cisapride because that's, that's the one standing out in my mind, is what we're looking at is are some um, parameters that are, might be predictors of what's taking, um, taking place in cell lines. So I don't know that I'm ready to say that there's a direct correlation between what we're seeing in her just yet, but they are definitely um, uh, strong predictors. Okay. Um, another question that was asked was, have you tested the calcium 4 kit uh, with this assay? Um, we actually have tested the calcium 4 kit. I don't have any data in this presentation. Um, the reason that we chose the calcium 5 kit is because of the proprietary calcium iota 4 uh, is more sensitive to the calcium and we get a larger signal window. So we um, get more bang for the buck, basically. Um, and, I, you know, the other calcium um, kits work, but you need to be able to, you know, see particularly um, those areas where you have smaller signals, um, where you have more inhibition, um, you can see more uh, with the bigger signal window. Okay. And kind of following on that, um, have you tested the membrane potential dyes? Um, we're not quite ready to release any of that, but we have... Um, tested the membrane potential dyes, and um, they work a little bit differently, so there's, there's some other work going on, but we're, we're not ready to, ready to release that yet. Okay. Um, and another question that we have is, how much optimization is required both to uh, develop each assay and to analyze each assay? So as far as um, developing the optimization, um, it was surprisingly simple. Once we um, dialed in the calcium signal and, and set the flipper tetra, you know, the flipper tetra parameters up so that we could, we could see that. In fact, we could actually do it because the cells were beating and sparking without adding anything. Um, we could optimize the signal. And, um, you know, then it was a matter of getting the concentrations right. Um, it was pretty much easy to, to set up. And then, um, as far as from assay to assay, we found the parameter to be, parameters to be very close um, to, to being the same um, for capturing that. Okay. Okay. Um, another question that we have is the excitation and contraction are both uh, known to be mediated by the calcium channel. So how do you separate these transient calcium signals? So in this case, we don't really separate them. Um, we see um, as the cell um, is excited and you have cell starts to contract, you have an influx of calcium and the signal goes up and then when it relaxes and releases the calcium and the concentration is decreased, then the um, signal goes down. So we're looking at both of them at the same time. We, we really haven't felt the need to separate them yet. Um, so I have another question that's come in related to the dyes. Um, is a calcium 5 dye, would that be toxic over extended periods of time? So the best window of time for um, setting up an experiment 
and then following, which would be about two hours um, after um, after you pull it off of the incubation um, time. So if you wanted to look at something more long term, you can um, set up multiple plates and add your compounds and take a look at them, and then add, at the intervals, then add some dye and then, and then read them. So there's an easy, there's an easy workaround for that. And then are you still able to compare results that you get immediately with results that um, you may take later on? Are you able to, to pull that data together? Um, yes. So within, um, with, I would say at least within a 24-hour period. And I think the other thing that's important to notice is that we're able to get data so quickly that um, it correlates, actually. We've got some other data that we haven't released yet. Um, when we've done some of these experiments, um, that they actually correlate. So um, the long-term effects are um, similar to the to the effects seen, you know, within the first primary experiment. So another question we have from the field is: Have you used the flipper technology to measure anatropy in vitro? Um, I'm not quite sure. Is there any more explanation around that one? Uh, no, that's all I have. Okay. So I'm assuming that, again, these are compounds that affect the, the, so the anatropy. Um, I'm assuming that that word is relating to the either rate or speed of the, of the, of the bee, if it's either um, contracting or expanding the um, beat rate, and we've actually done a little bit of that, um, but we kind of focused on the chronotropes um, just because we wanted to, um, you know, we were looking at beat rate and, and kind of optimizing for the instrumentation. Okay. But that, those, those are some more good suggestions for future experiments. Okay. Um, so another question I have is, how often do you see irregular beats in the controls? Um, depending on how far out the experiment's gone and whether or not the cells are at 37 degrees are the two pieces that affect that. Um, under our standard conditions, we don't see it a lot. If the cells are healthy and the lawn is beating as it should, um, we don't we don't see a lot of that kind of stuff in the controls. Even if we add buffer, you don't see it. Okay. Um, so I think that's actually all the time we have for questions today. So um, just to let everyone know that uh, we did record this call and it will be available to you to uh, review again at a later time. And so if you go to the uh, moleculardevices.webex.com and choose the event center, and then sort events by program, and you'll be able to find the innovative assays for the Flipper Tetra system, GPTRs, ion channel stem cells, and more series. And here you will find this recording. Um, additionally, uh, we previously were hosting our recordings at a, a different uh, WebEx location. Uh, we'll be moving those into this location, too. Um, it will take uh, probably a couple of days before we have the recording up there and loaded. And we will let folks know uh, by sending out an email. If you've registered for this, we'll send out an email to let everyone know that the recording is now available. Um, but so this is where we'll always be hosting any recordings related to the Flipper Tetra system. Additionally, if you want more information on the Flipper Tetra system, um, you can visit us at moleculardevices.com. And I just want to mention that also there will be a small survey that per pops up at the end of this webinar. Um, if you do want to be contacted with more information, either literature or to have somebody get in touch with you to talk with you more, um, fill out that survey, and that will feed that information back right away, and we'll make sure to get in touch with you as soon as possible, um, or to get in touch with you uh, very soon. And then just on behalf of Molecular Devices, I want to say thank you to Carol for giving the presentation today, 
And I also want to say thank you to everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you at future events, and I hope that you have a pleasant day. Thanks, everyone.